Well, thank you so much, Pascal Ami, for this. Uh, and uh, let me turn to Professor Paduan here on the stage in Milan. Professor Paduan, we just heard talking about fragmentation, and we know that in the last decade, especially when multilateralism was in a standstill position, there was a multitude of bilateral agreements and regional or free trade agreements. So you've been working on this also in your task force here at the T20. How, what do you think that can ensure consistency between bilateral agreements and multilateral agreements looking ahead? Thanks very much and good afternoon to everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, let me anticipate that I share very much many of the issues raised by Jeff Sachs and by Pascal Lamy, with whom we had a very tight collaboration in, <clears throat> in this process. He mentioned in his final uh, remarks the notion of risk. And this is something I would like to develop a little bit. First of all, how do we see the global economy after COVID? We see it as a fragmented entity. And so if there is something fragmented, the key question becomes, will fragmentation go further down the, the road or can we revert fragmentation? This is the key policy issue that at the global level, at the G20 level, should be addressed much more forcefully. Also because there are new risks down the line. If you look at the policy debate, the global policy debate these days, you list a long uh, number of factors of risk which I offer you only a small sample, but which are also telling of how much we should be aware of the fact that we need to have instruments to deal with risks. Well, the first risk that comes to mind is the new COVID risk. Is there the risk that we have a new COVID experience? Oh, well, heaven forbid, but this is a risk we must have in our agenda. Then we have risks which relate to the fact that the macroeconomics performance is at the turning point. There are now new talks of having a stagflationary situation going forward. More inflation, there's a lot of debate about that, but also less growth. And then, of course, there is the green transition which bears risk. One way uh, to characterize it is the following. The green transition might be going on too slowly, so we do not reach our targets. But paradoxically, it might be too fast because it generates pressure in the society which may not be sustainable. And this is a, a, cl a, cl a clear issue which uh, relates to fragmentation at large. Transformations in the, uh, uh, in the global system and, and its integration have to be dealing also with social sustainability. People must be the target of policies and therefore if policies do not target people, they are doomed to fail. So what, how do we shape up our uh, response to this situation? This is the last point that Pascal made. How do we transform a, a multipolar world into a newly integrated system? This is where the G20 come in with a, as a very powerful potential instrument. What G20 have to avoid is First of all, what we might be calling aggressive geopolitics, which uh, you all know what it means, which is a global responsibility. It's not because some countries or regions are more geopolitical than others. It's the way they interact that it's not acceptable. So how do we avoid geopolitics? One answer is, let's go down the regional alley. This is not a new debate in the international economy debate in the 1990s and 1980s. There was a lot of discussion asking the question, what do we do to replace the Bretton Woods system which collapsed? And the, 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 the conclusion was, we need a, a new regional structure. However, regionalism may be open or closed. And if it's closed, it's conflictual. So the, the question, in my view, becomes, how do we use platforms such as the G20 to generate open multilateralism and regionalism? Well, let me conclude my first statement by saying that we know a little bit about how in the past these systems operated, to know that there, there are a few conditions we need to be taken into account to make regionalism sustainable. One is that regionalism changes over the medium to long term. Therefore, countries participating in regional agreement, including in the bipolar sense, must be ready 
to adapt preferences so that there is a meeting of the minds, that we just do not keep our preferences intact and expect others to do changes. We must all have a propensity to change, number one. Number two, this happens over the long term. And this has to be accompanied by institution change, institutional changes. In our work of the, for the T T20, we looked at some depth at what, how to reform the WTO. And the WTO is an institution which has been very important, now needs to be revamped, but this needs to be put in context of the long term. Mm -hmm. And final point, and I'll stop, is this has to do having people in mind. And people in mind also means how to involve markets into the story. Uh, I may sound a little bit different with what Jeff Sachs said about markets, but we need to find ways, and we know that it is possible in practice, on how to generate incentives so that markets help rather than go against multilateralism. Let me conclude with one example. The environment and financial markets. Uh, we need to have a mechanism that redirect financial resources to finance infrastructure, to finance healthcare, to finance green development. This is possible. What we need to do it as a policymaker level is to design rules and implement rules in a way that reconcile social targets with individual incentives. This is possible, and there are many examples that show that this is the case. So, and, we, and in Europe, we are at the vanguard of this process. So I am very much confident that this is the way to go forward. Well, Professor Padoan, to go beyond fragmentation, it takes trust, it takes transparency, it takes a level playing field. So you've been working on that, and what are the main recommendations that you, you feel like to share from the T20 on this? Well, the main recommendation is, first of all, that uh, trade is important, but as Pascal said, it's not the only issue. So one uh, area of recommendation is exploit the political platform of the G20 to, uh, to look for what uh, economists of international relations call issue linkage. Uh, we can achieve improvement in trade relations if we couple it with security relations, so that on the table there are more options to be exploited by countries at, at around the table, number one. Number two, as I said before, the G20 by definition is a long-term uh, instrument. It, let me recall that the G20 as it stands today was established after the breakout of the great financial crisis. And since then it has evolved in, de in dictating the, the policy agenda. Sometimes it has worked, sometimes it has worked less. But there are case studies, cases in which there is success. So policy can be cooperative. We should reject the idea that there is only conflict among countries or among sovereigns over the long term. This is not so. It's difficult to find common agreements, collective agreements, collective goods, public goods, but it's possible. So this is uh, the major recommendation which comes out of the G20, and the WTO reform should be put in that perspective.